Thank you so much for uh, being here to talk about the future of television. First things first, the obvious, um, but uh, obviously linear television is going through a rough patch right now as viewers are flocking to uh, streaming platforms, digital viewing. Um, how can Hollywood's companies uh, successfully navigate the sea change that we're going through right now? Yeah, I'll kick it off. Um, yeah. Jeff Grossman from Paramount Plus. Um, so instinctively, I feel like I should also do, do a little bit of defense for linear TV. <laughs> um, you know, we're on the cusp of the new fall season on CBS, um, and we've seen some tremendous success already. And all, that success also translates to Paramount Plus. A lot of the shows that do really well on broadcast mm -hmm. and on cable linear do really well for us on the streaming side. So there is a, a symbiotic relationship there. Um, but we're also able to sort of reach a whole household and really elevate all the content, uh, first party content that Paramount creates from uh, kids and family content and franchises that you're probably familiar with like Sonic, SpongeBob and Paw Patrol to um, you know, adult and procedural series uh, where CBS is incredibly strong like NCIS. Um, and then on the theatrical side with a really strong uh, Paramount slate um, so we're really able to sort of bring all the content inside of the company together uh, in, a, in a dynamic platform where we're really focused on sort of all the signals that we're getting from our subscribers and our audience so that we can serve you the right content at the right time. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for having me here today. I'm Javier Pons from Telemundo, NBC Telemundo. Uh, well, um, I, I agree with him. Uh, we are going the, not to, not to defend the linear, but uh, but I have heard so many times that the uh, the linear is is going to die and it's going to die in the next uh, three years and the next five years and when you when we pass three years and when we pass five years they say well it will be <laughs> later so uh, I, I think there is a clear uh, trend yeah. and uh, I am going to explain to you how we are working there in, in BC Telemundo. Uh, we are playing offense there. Uh, we have a strong operation, uh, business operation feeding our core business that is the linear, this mm -hmm. is, the, mm -hmm. is the linear channel Telemundo, but also we have a start uh, five years ago, uh, a new strategy uh, with, uh, with the third parties and it's BOD. So uh, we are always keeping our uh, client, first and main client at Telemundo, but also we are creating premium content for the platforms. So th I think this is the, the game, no? The, uh, yeah. I, I think everyone of us is in the, in the same game, no? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, a lot of uh, the defense goes to, de defense to use your word, Jeff, <laughs> but uh, goes to diversification and how all of it is feeding each other, kind of like a symbiotic relationship, of course. Um, now, uh, Roku Media. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, at, at Roku, we're in a slightly different position since we are, first and foremost, a streaming platform. So part of our primary task is to help companies successfully make that transition. And we have partnerships with everybody, including Paramount, including Telemundo. I mean, Paramount Plus lives on our OS, as do all major apps. We have a great partnership with Telemundo. Um, both via Peacock and in Fast. So, you know, I think we see the same thing. It's just our, our purpose really is to facilitate the streaming transition. Yeah, yeah, no, and with that in mind, you know, of course, uh, there's that conversation, the, the uh, perennial is linear dying conversation, but then there's also the over competition in streaming. You know, there's a lot of streaming platforms, a lot of streaming brands, um, a lot of content coming out every week, every day. Um, how, how can you guys make a mark uh, with your content? And how do you approach that in such a competitive um, era? I guess I'll go again. Yeah. So <laughs> we have um, some of our own content and of course facilitate uh, the viewer getting to content they want wherever it may live. So mm -hmm. uh, as an operating system, we're of course there to get the viewer to Netflix, to Paramount Plus, to Peacock, wherever it is that they want to go in streaming. We also have the Roku channel, which is our proprietary AVOD service. It's now a top 10 streaming service unto itself. And the big insight of the Roku channel, it's 
why it got started was that we realized that in streaming, people also wanted content that was free. So it is proudly free and ad supported, has been from the beginning. And I think one of the big sort of swings we've seen in the last couple of years, especially, is advertising coming roaring back into basically every streaming app at this point, maybe save Apple um, has an ad tier. Uh, but I think that's actually gonna end up bolstering the health of the streaming ecosystem more largely. Yeah, as, 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 as we say before, we are diversifying our windows and we are diversifying our content. No? Uh, mm -hmm. we, are, uh, we have a long history doing long forms, but now we are doing premium content. How we face that? We face that with uh, our linear uh, channel, but we also face that with uh, the digital wall. So mm -hmm. we have our own app, uh, Telemundo. Uh, we have uh, our vertical in Peacock. So uh, our content, you can see it in, in Peacock, and uh, you can uh, see our content also in YouTube and in fast channels. And um, just for telling some, some, uh, about some numbers uh, in Peacock, um, we are, um, the last numbers that we had uh, three months ago, it was uh, something like 4.3 4 million views. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, the, in the inside the NBCU uh, application, uh, the two top shows are from Telemundo, mm -hmm. from El Señor de los Cielos y La Reina del Sur. Mm -hmm. So uh, with this whole new diversifying and yeah. strategy in digital, I think that uh, we are assuming the future. Yeah, for and us, we are where uh, we. Uh, sorry, and we please. are where we are where we our audience are. No, so yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, a couple of things. One is we've been uh, ad supported as an SVOD service from the get go. Mm -hmm. um, and we're also kind of in a unique position at Paramount Streaming where we have Pluto TV and Paramount Plus. So we do have this combination of both free and a paid ecosystem where both services have tiers or, or have elements that are ad supported in them. Uh, but back to the question about sort of how you differentiate. Mm -hmm. uh, part of it is that, you know, foundationally, we're, I think we're all working with some phenomenal, broad, uh, very appealing content. For us, it's, you know, sports, the NFL, uh, UEFA soccer, for example, um, huge franchises, Yellowstone, some of the kids' franchises I already mentioned. Um, and then really being able to sort of build a, a, an original content strategy on the back mm -hmm. of uh, titles and franchises that already have a significant amount of demand in market. And so that's one of the sort of unique things that we're well positioned to do because we have a, you know, sort of strong legacy studio and linear business. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, uh, one of the things that um, we're seeing as, you know, we look at these trends and uh, what uh, the buyers are willing to buy and willing to invest in, a lot of that comes to these big franchises, this lenience on uh, IP. And you, you, Jeff, your company has a really big gold mine with Yellowstone, obviously. Um, even though, obviously, the uh, streaming uh, for the show itself is on Peacock, uh, you guys have managed to leverage uh, the whole Taylor Sheridan verse uh, into just just a million <laughs> spin-offs and other types of shows from Taylor Sheridan. How, how, talk to us a little bit more about like the strategy to build up on his creativity and on this universe and. Yeah, there yeah. are, I mean, there are some fundamental elements that sort of play through, I think most of the Taylor shows mm -hmm. um, that make them accessible and really appealing. Um, there is sort of this element where you have kind of this high stakes environment where you know, uh, a lead character is either livelihood or life is kind of on the line. But at the same time, there are these really sort of relatable familial elements yeah. that I think audiences really connect to. Um, and that's something that you're going to find in sort of our prequels to Yellowstone, 1883 and 1923. Um, in Tulsa King, we just launched the second season of Tulsa King on Paramount Plus. Yes. Um, and it's already doing incredibly well for us and actually building on, on season one. Um, and then we have a, a new series coming uh, in November, mid-month, called Landman, starring Billy Bob Thornton, uh, which also sort of extends that same kind of sensibility. Um, and so there's just uh, been a, kind of a, a treasure chest of, of storytelling uh, that does have similar elements, but is really sort of resonating with a really broad audience. 
Yeah, yeah, and, and relatedly, you know, uh, for you guys, how are you, how is uh, Telemundo and Haroku leveraging the IP that you already have into the content that you're creating now? Yeah, well, we have a, a big advantage is uh, the language, the Spanish language. Mm -hmm. uh, we are the, the, the first and uh, leading producing uh, company in the Spanish language in the U.S. Uh, we have uh, this uh, audience of 63 million that we can reach. And we can, but, but we can go further on, and we can go uh, to access to a, to a market with uh, 600 million people speaking in Spanish. So uh, we are proud to say that we, we think and we produce uh, content uh, from Hispanic uh, people to Hispanic people. Mm -hmm. And this is our goal. And, uh, and what, how we do that? We do that with uh, people uh, emerging and edgy. Uh, with edgy shows in Argentina that they are traveling around the world, um, like uh, El Marginal, or now we are uh, shooting the, the, the spin off of El Marginal that is called El Barro for mm -hmm. Netflix. Uh, but also, we are um, shooting in Uruguay and uh, Colombia uh, premium content. Um, just, I repeat, just to, to reach these 63 million, but all the whole audience, the global audience. And uh, you have to, 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 to know something that. Uh, for us, it's a challenge because our audience, the, the Hispanic audience, is 20% younger than the American average uh, uh, age. Yeah. So uh, we have to be there. We have to be in digital. We have to, to, to keep our core business, but we have to be uh, clever doing this, this, uh, this diversification in, into that. Yeah, yeah, no, and it's good to see that you're producing shows for other uh, platforms as well, not just for Telemundo, but um, I'll let you know. I, I think for us, the point of differentiation actually really begins at the home screen, because we're mm -hmm. in more American homes than any other streaming service. That's an incredibly powerful tool. So, you know, for 80 million households, the Roku home screen is the first screen they see when they turn on their TV, so that when we foreground content or an experience on it, whether it's for our own purposes, for one of our partners, or for an advertiser, that's really where we start the differentiation is with the first click. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, uh, and uh, so much of that, that curation is very important just as we're trying to navigate this um, at times oversaturated market because there are so many new shows, there are so many new options, and as you said, you know we're on the fall series, we're on the the fall, the beginning of the fall season. So many new shows are starting traditional in traditional uh, avenues, but then you know you have streamers producing, uh, producing and premiering stuff every day, cable networks doing the same thing. What does it take to successfully uh, put out a show and you know make it? make it so that people know what's coming and raise that awareness. Um. Yeah, um, well, in some cases, we're sort of building awareness from the ground up, right? In other cases with franchise, we have pre-sold IP, and so there's a, a, already a built-in awareness and, mm -hmm. as I said, potentially demand that's already there in the market for us to leverage. Uh, but it also takes a really strong tactical marketing plan, um, and we use both you know, third-party paid marketing and performance media and really the strength of our first party platforms, which include all the reach of CBS and cable that we have uh, inside of Paramount to help propel and make sure that there's, you know, sort of a high awareness and attentive view around all of our priority originals. Um, and so, you know, we have, for example, you know, an incredible opportunity this fall with, um, with the NFL to leverage that um, to help push not only the CBS original fall lineup, but also the originals that we have coming to Paramount Plus. Um, and that's just one of many examples that we try to thread sort of, you know, sort of all of our opportunities and touch points with potential subscribers and audiences uh, to focus on, uh, you know, new programming or programming that may be new to them. Yeah, I think to some extent success in streaming is striking a nice balance between the shows that you should know about and the shows that everybody should know about. Um, so on the one hand, you know, you have more and more sophisticated data that shows you based on your preferences, things that you may enjoy. But then when we activate around the Olympics, we make the Olympics unescapable. Oh. And, you know, that, that was a great sort of activation with NBCU. And we've done really big ones with Paramount Plus as well. Yeah, yeah well, I, I, I wanted to speak about the Olympics, but uh, I also want to, to speak about the, the World Cup that is coming in two years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
and we are preparing with, uh, with all, the, all the people in tele, NBC Telemundo and NBC. Uh, as, you, as you asked, how, how do you make a, a successful show for streaming? Uh, William Goldman told us uh, some years ago that nobody knows nothing. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway, I can tell you that um, for us, creating IP, own IP is uh, our own strategy. In this moment, it's, it's a strategic, mm -hmm. and uh, we are doing the good talent, let them free, let them work, and, and uh, let them create their own storytelling and uh, support them, because, uh, and take some risk. I think uh, mm. uh, these days that we are um, uh, hearing about uh, how uh, someone like for Coppola, sorry, mm. take, took the risk. Uh, it's not a good example, but <laughs> I think that you have to, 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 get, the, to get some risk uh, doing, mm. uh, doing shows. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's the that's the challenge because uh, obviously uh, we see a lot of success when people take creative risks. You know, you see Baby Reindeer, uh, you know, doing great in the Emmys. Um, those are the types of shows that get attention, but those aren't necessarily the shows that, um, you know, your companies are green lighting. <laughs> Not to to put it like that, but um, but and now just to, uh, overall, like the industry is kind of like not to hesitating to take risks. So how can, how can we kind of like preserve that artistic risk on, when we're in a risk averse environment? I do think there's a, you know, you have to look at the overall mix of content um, and you wanna make sure you have a diverse offering, especially if you're addressing a whole household like we are. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we do have shows that I would put in the sort of more Risky category um, shows like Colin from Accounts, which is an Australian show, mm -hmm. which is a an truly endearing and wonderful comedy, yeah. which has binge dropped the second season. That's my plug for that show. <laughs> um, we also just released uh, a documentary uh, the, about the guys behind South Park uh, called Casa Bonita Mi Amor, which is mm -hmm. about the, uh, it's a documentary. It's, it's uh, really been th released theatrically as well. Um, and they found, uh, they had this uh, love for this restaurant in Denver um, that they renovated and it was truly this incredibly daunting story uh, to bring the restaurant back into sort of operational uh, success. And, um, and so we have, you know, content like that that we're consistently trying to elevate in the service and, and bring to um, our subscribers in addition to sort of the more familiar tentpole content. Yeah. Um, so it is a mix. Yeah, it's, it's a mix. It's a mix between the risk and other things because it's, it's, uh, it's a funny thing. Uh, five years, eight years ago, uh, when the streaming uh, began, uh, all, all was uh, edgy shows, uh, far away from the linear TV, from the mainstream. And uh, right now, two years ago, uh, they are beginning to ask us to make for them long form shows, mm. more solid, like the, 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 the historic uh, mainstream shows that we have been doing for 27 years. So we have to mix and combine no? the, the risk and uh, these, uh, I, these uh, formulas that works and, and that, uh, that gives comfort. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think one way to make sure that there's still enough creative risk built into the system is to continue to nurture rising talents. And I think increasingly try to look at that convergence of the digital world with the TV world. We see it happening sort of every day. So it's gonna be interesting over the next five years to see some of the talents who came up via YouTube, came up via social channels, mm. have their visions for what TV and film can mean to them. And I think we're starting to see it already a little bit in real time. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's interesting as we're getting into this period of transition and um, seeing uh, how free ad-supported uh, streaming platforms become more popular, how um, broadcast shows that are, you know, like that procedural format, or it's interesting to hear you, Javier, say that you're being asked to produce more, like, longer form uh, shows like you used to do in the past. Like, everyone, it seems like audience interest is to go back to what... TV used to be, or like to to go back to that episodic format, to go back to that stuff. Is that is that kind of like the that? How, how do you take that energy from 
what consumers are asking for into your decision making as you're greenlighting content. Uh, I'll, I can take that one. Um, well, I think that on the one hand, we're to some degree all competing for, you know, kind of share of screen time, mm -hmm. right? Um, and that includes social and other platforms. Um, uh, but at the same time, I think, you know, we're all believers in long form storytelling um, and real character development and that there's, you know, been a place for that um, for in, in the entire history of television and really sort of in general. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're more focused on sort of figuring out how to look at sort of each individual title and map it to the appropriate audience and make sure that we're able to reach that audience. And, um, and really leveraging a rich tool set, whether that's on our product or sampling with some of our partners like David and Roku, mm -hmm. um, to make sure that we're driving sort of the interest, the awareness, and the availability of, of that long form storytelling. Yeah. Oh, I, I was just gonna say the other, the other sort of note that comes up all the time is that I think people perceive risk mostly being associated with new original programs, and of course that's true, but there are business risks associated with foundational IP that are just as profound, right? So if I'm in your shoes at Paramount uh, and I have Survivor, there's gonna be a question of how many places should this live? How are you using it to get new audience, but when do you start cannibalizing an audience? And those are real risk reward scenarios that any company has to sort through nowadays. By the way, I love the fact that Survivor is on Paramount Plus and now a little <laughs> bit on Roku. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it all, it all feeds into each other again. And um, uh, I, I would be remiss to uh, talk about the shaping the future of television without talking about sports, um, which obviously um, has always been a sure bet in uh, attracting wide audiences, but seems to have gotten just a lot more cutthroat in terms of, uh, you know, uh, securing those distribution rights. Um, there's a lot of talk about that. Um, a lot of people are green lighting complementary programming, you know, lots of docu-series, lots of shows about sports, uh, stuff like that. Um, why, what, and we can start with uh, David first. <laughs> um, why, why is sports such a hot ticket right now? Oh. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Life. The, the life uh, is, is the key mm -hmm. answer for that. No, the the the, the life events are uh, always going to be uh, a point uh, for for the audience, and and the sports have that. Uh, the, you you can't see the match uh, of soccer or NFL tomorrow uh, later because uh, you want to know tonight what happens because tomorrow you have to to go to the office to go to the school and you have to talk about it <laughs> so i think the, the the live event we saw a, a amazing work of, uh, of our teams on nbc and nbc telemundo for the olympics yeah. and and, uh, and and in the next future we have nba and we have the world cup and uh, and it's a, it's a bet that the company do uh, because mm, the company does because uh, i think the, in, in this moment it's an asset it's, it's, it's an, an no, for, for me, it's Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe a less risky bet, but still an expensive one. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, just to, to the point of, you know, we are seeing so much more sports-related content as well. Like, why, why is there such an evolution on that side of things, too? Um, well, as, as Javier just said, you, you know, you have this built-in urgency, obviously, to the live sports events. Um, uh, we've seen it firsthand. We took, I think, a, a sort of a leap of faith around uh, Champions League soccer in the US. We have those English language rights on Paramount Plus and it's done phenomenally well for us. Um, and then we're also looking to understand how to complement that programming in those live moments with, you know, whether it's deeper dives on some of the players or the teams themselves, or just kind of celebrating sport overall. I think there is um, an opportunity in what we're seeing sort of breakthrough is um, perhaps a little less specific to um, you know, exactly what the, the sport is and more about just the, the, the story behind it, all the things that have always made really great, compelling docu-series. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, so we're looking for, consistently looking for opportunities to sort of, um, you know, leverage our live audience um, and, it, and to maintain that relationship in between games. Yeah, I mean, I think sports is the one genre that just unimpeachably supports both subscription behavior and advertiser investment. So if it's going to be a hybrid model going forward, it's the thing 
that most obviously does both. And then that's been, I think, even further catalyzed by the fact that what's happening in women's sports is like really nothing I've ever seen yeah. in terms of just a step change in interest and investment and viewership and attendance. And it's like an amazing moment in time. Yeah, I think uh, the, the big challenge is retaining, no? because uh, I think the work that we have to do and we are doing, uh, our teams are doing is to work to attract, uh, to appeal mm -hmm. from the core fan to the casual fan. And, uh, and there are a lot of storytellings in the, in the middle, so you can create amazing things that, uh, not talking about the, the match, but you're talking about the story behind mm -hmm. the match. No? So I think this is the big challenge for, for the future. And not, not getting just the rights for the match. You know? How do you retain the people more time and uh, engaging? Awesome. Um, yeah, so uh, we only have one minute, but get ready because it's a big one. <laughs> um, but um, obviously, you know, TV has changed significantly in the past 10 years, and we, uh, everyone keeps saying that the distortion isn't going anywhere. Um, but there's, you know, always a light at the end of the tunnel, maybe. <laughs> um, and yeah, we'll, we'll see. But um, to you know, you guys think about this all the time. You're having discussions with people. You're planning ahead. What's your forecast uh, for what the future of TV looks like? I mean, I think we'll we have we're kind of discussing all the elements that are going to be part of the ingredients of whatever the sort of future entertainment formula is. Um, exactly sort of what they look like five or 10 years down the road, I think is something that we're all building towards, but you know, probably can't give you a sort of a, a crystal ball approach to it today. What I can say is that, um, you know, we're about three and a half years into Paramount Plus. Um, we've sort of, you know, uh, led the market in terms of subscriber acquisition over that period. We're sort of hitting all of our, our benchmarks for the business. Um, that even a few years ago seemed aspirational. So we feel really good about the, tr the trajectory that we're seeing in streaming, both for Paramount Plus and Pluto. Um, and, um, and we're excited to see kind of how that evolves with, with the rest of the ecosystem. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, when you talk about the future, I am optimistic. Uh, I think that uh, we have a lot of future um, because I am not talking about uh, just TV, I am talking about uh, content. And uh, I don't know, I have uh, 35 years in this, uh, in this uh, industry and I think this is the best moment in my life to work in, with content. So because I have so many opportunities, so many choices, so many chances yeah. to, to create and to give uh, the power to a creator, uh, to, to, to a screenwriter, to a director. So uh, I think the future is that for us. So it's, uh, I think it will be great and funny, yeah. I hope. <laughs> I too am optimistic. I think consumption of video content isn't going anywhere. If anything, um, these next generations get even more of their information, even more of their entertainment through video. And I, what I see too is more and more people want that back on the biggest screen in the home, which is the TV. So, yeah. And it will be a TV more social, maybe. Yeah. Definitely, it all goes back together, and we all want to watch stuff, so <laughs> amazing. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much for your time. I thank really you. appreciated it. And, yeah. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>